Just to um, retell the story a little bit. To retell the story. Especially for those who are new to Grandview or who are visiting here today. In 2011, 2011, we, this church, offered ourselves to God. In effect, we took that Isaiah scripture and said, here we are, Lord, send us. Now, we didn't know where God was going to send us. But as a, a community of faith, as a congregation, we prayed for a year and talked about it, thought about it, investigated things. We just knew in 2011, in June of 2011, that God had called us to go to truly the least of these. Matthew, Matthew 25, the least of these. We knew that. We knew that, and so we began to pray. We, we said specifically, you know how sometimes, and believe me, I've thought about this on some of those long, hot, dusty, dirty uh, car rides uh, in Nigeria. Um, uh, you know, you have to be careful what you pray for and ask God for, right? So I said, I remember we talked about this, and I would tell people that would come to me, and they'd say, well, what about this mission to Cambodia or Haiti or wherever, Guatemala? And, and I would look at those and say, is that where God's calling us? And we'd pray about it, and I would look at it and say, no, no, we want to go. We, we want to go. Granby wants to go where no one else is. We want to go uh, to people who are struggling and are challenged for the basics, the basics, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, you know, for food, for clean, clean water, for safety, for shelter, for health, for education. We want to we wanna go to people people who, are, who want and need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so for a year, we prayed and we, and we talked about this. We said, lead us and guide us and send us to your people, Lord, who don't have access, who do not have access to, to Samaritan's Purse or the Red Cross or UNICEF or, or government grants. Send us to people that don't have access to things like free and reduced lunches or housing assistance or food pantries or clothes pantry. Send us to people who need some hope and some encouragement and who most of all need to see the love of Jesus Christ in motion. That was in 2011 and we prayed and we asked for that. And in 2012, in 2012, God led us to this little village in Nigeria um, called Damka. And we said, we said in 2012, and then when we, when we sent the first mission team in 2013, we said that Damka matters, right? We said Damka matters to God. This little corner, this remote corner, this little area that would seem so insignificant out, out in the, uh, the Nigerian bush, you know, in the, in the continent of Africa. There I've circled where Nigeria is. It's right there. That's the country. We said, God's sending us here to these people. And it could seem so insignificant. Domka on the continent of Africa. We said Domka matters to God and Domka matters to us. Not everybody, and I understand that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to everybody. I've heard that through the years. Some people get weary of hearing that and say, well, why are we putting all our eggs in that basket? And gosh, we have people starving in our own backyard. But again, you know, my criteria for that is what I just said, is that the least of these, the least of these, and um, it's hard to find, and I know they're probably here, but none of them came across our radar screen of the least of these here in the United States that have nothing, nothing, really nothing. So Domka, we were sent to Domka. We said, send us. And it's on the continent of, of Africa. And just to help, you know, get, get you acclimated to where that is, there's the country of Nigeria. And the white star, the white star over there on the right is the, the city of Yola. And that's where we fly into. If you, go, if you go up, if you go north of Yola, up in Borno State and those other places, that's where when you hear the news reports of Boko Haram, the, the, the Muslim terrorist uh, groups. Um, that's where most of that activity is, though some of it spreads down to Yo Yoba State and some other places. It comes close to Yola, the white star. It comes very close there. We fly in to Yola. We, we actually uh, go from Germany and we drop straight down to the purple star. That's Abuja. Abuja. We, we stay in Abuja overnight at a guest house. The guest house is run by the Bureau of Prisons and it's not very far from the airport. Um, so it's really safe there for us. But the first, when they first said to me, well, you're going to stay in the prison guest house, I wasn't sure about that. So, oh, well, I suppose we'll be safe there. But anyway, we land in Abuja, and then we fly over to Yola, and then we drive, we drive, it's 130 miles to go to the seminary. Banyam Theological Seminary is the only United Methodist seminary in that whole country, the only one. The only United Methodist seminary that's training pastors to serve this exploding, 
United Methodist Church. So we drive from the White Star to the, to the uh, Yellow Triangle, to BTS, Banyan Theological School. It's about 130 miles, and uh, given the conditions of the roads in, in Nigeria, it takes us four to five hours to drive those 130 miles um, with uh, rough roads. And, um, you know, I, I uh, uh, did, I really did. I took off on Thursday on my motorcycle. I had to deliver a bag to Sioux City, a bag from John Pennett in to his son, Teddy, who lives in Sioux City. So it was a great excuse to get on the motorcycle and ride. And I had a, 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 just a wonderful privilege of being able to ride from river to river, you know what I mean? From the Mississippi to the Missouri on Thursday and to ride all the way across the beautiful state of Iowa, um, you know, and, and then ride home on Friday. Um, I visited our United Methodist camp at Okoboji, and, and then I rode home, and here's why I'm telling you this, is that I did, um, I did basically six hours each day but that was an accumulation of 750 miles. You with me? Because we have good roads. So we go, we go to BTS, and it looks like this on an even closer up view, is you have, um, uh, you have the yellow star up there is where BTS is, Banyan Theological School. And then the white star is Domka. It's 30 miles. 30 miles from the yellow star to the white star. 30 miles. It takes about... It takes about two and a half to three hours to drive that. So um, I'm not sure what's 30 miles from here. What's 30 miles from here? Manchester? Makokota. Drive to Makokota on field roads. That'll give you an idea. Okay? Through ditches and washouts and creeks and this and that. Now, just to get you up to speed, this is where Domka is. And it's remote. You think you've been in remote places? You think you've been like some place and you say, wow, we're in the middle of nowhere. No, you haven't been. That's the middle of nowhere. Okay? Or at least that feels that way to me. This is the, the facts. We go into uh, the continent of Africa to the country of Nigeria. And we go to the state of Taraba. That's Taraba State there where the stars are. And then to, to funnel on down, we go to the, uh, the Wukum, W-U-K-U-M, the Wukum uh, tribal villages. The Wukum tribal villages are 26 villages. Of those, there are three, um, Gora and Jebjeb and uh, uh, Gora, Jebjeb, and Damka are three villages that are um, led by this chief. This is man in white, obviously not me. Um, the chief there is a Muslim chief. This, by the way, is um, predominantly Muslim area that God has called us into, of all places. And we go there to Damka, and this chief is uh, uh, the leader there. And so we always take time. That's who gave me the rock, as I said. And, and this time... Um, I forgot to bring it up here. This time I, I took uh, the chief, um, uh, one of those great gifts uh, that symbolize love and, and Americana, I took him a couple landscape lights. <laughs> really, <laughs> I did, solar landscape lights, because that's a big thing. And, you know, uh, to people over there who, who really have nothing, um, anything is something. You know what I mean? And so, in return, he gave me a farming implement. He gave me the, the short-handled hoe that they use, and it's engraved on the back that says friendship and unity, uh, Yasaki, uh, friendship and unity. Um, here's, a, here's this chief um, that we go and we talk with and we make peace with. And at the very beginning, three years ago, we went down to see the chief because we realized we were in a Muslim area. And so we went down there, um, really led by God. You know, when we talk about God making the impossible possible, we went and we sat, um, and I said, you know, uh, we respect that you're a person of God. We respect um, that you're doing your best to follow your faith. We, too, are people of God and doing the best, our best uh, to follow our God. And, um, and we believe in Jesus and so forth. And I made that little speech, and uh, um, we shook hands and said prayers, and everybody else made speeches. And then... Then the Domka chief and his, his council observed us in 2013, and specifically they observed us giving a, a $20 soccer ball to the young men of the village that were playing soccer, and that changed everything. It changed everything. It really did. It changed how this man and these people saw us. Even in the face of opposition from other Muslim chiefs, of other villages who say to this chief and who say to the big chief, this is the chief of the 26 tribes, uh, he, he's uh, the big, I don't know how else to say it, the big chief, and we had a chance to meet with him um, uh, two weeks ago, the Gora chief. And uh, 
It made a difference to them. Now here's a thing to consider. We said send us. And we thought we were just going to go over and do a school and a soccer ball and a soccer team and maybe some clean water. But there's something bigger going on here. In fact, it goes to this very theme that we're talking about today. The power of love. The power of love. It's interesting that this chief, this chief um, went in to meet with him and to make the speeches. And it's, it's very formal and kind of pomp and circumstance, if you will. And he, he, he began to tell his story. This man, this chief of the Wookum tribe, um, spent three years at Oxford. He's an educated man. Oxford in, in London. But he talked about how in 1957, he did his primary school in Bambor. Bambor is where the seminary is. He did his primary school in Bambor, and so he told us, he said, you know, I did my primary school in Bambor with the Christian missionaries. And he said, you know, that was in 1957. It would have been the EUV, Evangelical United Brethren, were over there, missionaries, Christian missionaries. And then he said, and then in 1968, I was still going to school there when you became the United Methodist Church. Interesting, isn't it? That this chief and the other chief have seen people, white people, travel great distances in the name of Jesus Christ, and it has changed their hearts and their minds. And so they allow us to do our work in this area. These two chiefs have observed Christians who genuinely want to help. They've observed people offering themselves to be used by God without asking for anything in return. And that's part of the deal here. We're not asking anything in for return, but you know what? We receive it. That's the way God's grace works. We receive, we, and I hope you feel this, we receive this incredible blessing. We receive this incredible incredible blessing of knowledge that we're engaged in something big, that we're engaged in something that isn't about soccer balls and schools and clean water. It's about helping transform the world in the name of Jesus Christ, one heart and one village at a time. And in the midst, in the midst of what's going on in our world right now, we're with television and cable and, and, and internet and everything else, we are up to date 24-7 on some of the horrible, hateful things going on in this world between Christians and Muslims, and suddenly Grandview United Methodist Church finds itself right in the midst of it, not killing, not using force, only taking the side of love. Only taking the side of believing that at great risk and great expense, by just showing up in the name of Jesus, by just showing up and being graceful and being flexible and being open and praying with and praying for these people in a faraway place, just showing up. These folks are smart. They get it. They understand it. And they're encouraged. These two leaders, these Muslims, they acknowledge to me that, the, 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 that since 9-11 especially, the tension between Christians and Muslims is, is very real. They talked to me about that. They talked about how enemies, how it's so much easier, black and white, to see people as enemies. And yet, and yet, these two leaders in this little corner of the world, they see Christians offering God, and they see Christians offering peace, and they see Christians offering love, and it's changing them. It is. And it's, it's changing them and it's changing the world and it allows us to do our work in Nigeria. And my point, I hope that you're getting this and connecting this dot here, is that, is that going forth and trying our best to do what Jesus said to do, and that is to demonstrate love even to enemies, even to people we don't know, even to people that we don't expect to get anything back from. That when we really do our best to do this honestly and authentically, even if you never put your boots on the ground over there, if you've prayed about it and if you've given money or you've given your support for it, this is us. This is us. And it is the gospel come to life, I believe. And so we continue to go into this part of the world. This most recent trip, we had a chance to see that in this little village where in 2012 there was nothing under this tree, they had a, a crude table made which was served as like their communion table and altar. And this little small Christian group worshipped under the tree there in the Domka village. Now they have a building, a building, they have a permanent 
spot, a symbol there with the biggest cross and flame in all Nigeria, I think. At least that was my goal, okay, when I painted it. They have this. They have clean water that's improving their lives. They have the soccer team, the Domke United Football Club. This man in yellow that you see up on the screen, this man um, uh, 20 years before played uh, on the Nigerian national team, played soccer, and he heard about, he had heard about this Domka United Football Club that, that was made up of Muslim and Christian men that uh, went around and they played in other villages. And he moved his family to Domka. His wife, his two children, and he coaches our soccer team. He coaches them. So I said, when I talked to him, Umbako, I said, you know, I want to give you $500. I know that's not much, but of course over there it's something. Just as a stipend, just as a way to say thank you. And I'm pretty confident that we can raise that $500 to give the coach what say you. Amen? Because this is one of the ways God is working. And all we did is roll out a soccer ball. And it caused the Muslim chief and his leaders to say, we think you can stay. And more than that, it caused them to say, which we can't put out there and publicize, it caused the Muslim chief to say, you know, Islam never gave me a soccer ball. And now this Muslim chief says to the other Muslim chiefs, Islam never built a school here for my grandchildren. Islam and jihad, Boko Haram, they never put a clean water well in our village. But the Christians did. Isn't that interesting? The power of love. Just started through a soccer ball. There's the team. Let me tell you about making sacrifices for you all. These young men here had played for about three hours in 110 degree heat. They played a great soccer match and they came to me and said, will you watch? And I said, I will watch. The least I can do is stand here in the sunshine and watch you guys play. So they played. And so afterwards I presented, um, I presented uh, the flags to them and that new soccer ball and, and uh, gave the coach a jersey. And they all wanted to take their picture with me and they all crowded in there and that's where I really made a sacrifice uh, for you and for God because three hours, hot, sweaty, and everybody wanted to stand next to me. And I'm still smiling, aren't I? That's our soccer team, and it's how God works. This is the children in our school. These are the children in our school because God continues to work. There are 255 children getting an education. I want to put it this way. I want to, I want to really make sure we understand this, is that we are changing these children's story. Do you know what I mean? Their story was one way and was going to be one way in their life. Not that it was going to be bad, but suddenly there are 255 children that are learning to read and write in both Hausa and English and are learning basic facts and basic information. And so when I get to the point, as I did a couple weeks ago, when I can get my, my emotions under control and I can go in and talk to these children, I absolutely positively meet it when I go into this cornstalk classroom. And tell them how proud we are of them. How proud we are. We, Grandview. How proud we are and to keep working hard and don't give up and don't get discouraged. And listen to your teachers and your parents. And who knows which one of you is going to be a teacher. And which one of you will be a pastor. And which one of you will be a leader. You see where this goes? And to give that speech to these kids, to have that privilege and that opportunity to me is powerful. Powerful. We're changing their story. Because of what God called us to do, and we were willing, church, to say, here am I, send me. We were willing, didn't know where it would take us, and that's partly where it's taken us, and we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Look, this time when we were over there, um, it was tense. Um, where, where I've drawn the pink up there, you know, um, there's a lot of unrest in that country right now, and the military is cracking down hard on Boko Haram, the terrorists, and they've started to scatter out into the countryside. And you've got people up on the border of those other states that started, started to hear about Domka. They've started to hear about those white missionaries that are showing up there and making a difference. They've started to hear about this, this growing peace. Now look, did we think this was going to be easy? I hope you didn't. This isn't some tropical vacation. This isn't a VIP tour. It never was. We asked God to send us to the least of these. Remember that? And so I understand it's not for everybody to go, but I'm going to keep going in spite of the fact that when we hit Nigeria, the bishop pulled me aside and said, here's the deal. I can't let you stay out there for four nights in a row. There are people moving through the bush that are being influenced by some people um, from Boko Haram. There are Muslim villages, not around Domka, but up on the border, that are very jealous and very resentful, and they want to harm you, and they want to stop this mission. So we're sending this federal police officer, Abdul, 
the Nigerian nightmare. This guy was big and scary. And he went with us everywhere we went. It's a good man, good Christian man. He went with us everywhere we went, and that's what the scoop is. Now, I've since got updates that that is kind of calm, calmed down, but um, this is real, folks. It's real. To take the love of Christ and put it in the midst of your real enemies. And I'm not talking about the enemies we perceive in this community. I'm not talking about the people who disagree with us. I'm not just talking about the people who inconvenience us. I'm not talking about the people who have a different point of view from us about things like, like same-sex marriage or about which version of the Bible to read or, or neighbors fighting over boundaries. I'm not talking about those people because when you've been there and when you understand that there are people that really want to harm you, not just sue you in a court of law, not just scowl at you in the high V. Are you with me on this? You really get this bigger, deeper understanding of what, how radical Jesus was when he said, love your enemies. Love them. And show them the face of Christ. So that's where we're called to do it. And the work continues. There's some of the teachers. We paid the teachers. Our work continues. But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than me running around Nigeria with a backpack full of cash. Okay? That's a, a picture of that, to pay the teachers. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than picture day. Remember picture day in school? We did picture day out in Domka so we could get photographs of every single child with the chalkboards that the people here made. We sent over and the chalk that you sent over. We, uh, we had the adults write every child's name on there and they posed for their picture. And I say what we're doing is bigger than just those things that cost money. It's about this little girl and about hundreds of others that we're giving hope and encouragement to. And so we've, we've done the work. And thanks to you, we accomplished it. We were able to get contracts for uniforms for these children. Two uniforms per year, $2,600. That's about five bucks a kid. How about that? Okay? That was part of our work over there is to get that worked out. Some of the others, Arlona and Jordan had fun playing games with the kids, but it's even bigger than that. Again, it's, it's bigger than that. It's, here's a shot of the school bags. Some of you women here in this church sew these bags, right? Well, here they are in Nigeria. That's me with the UMW leader from the village there um, in Bambor. And she's uh, unloading school kits. And I said, hey, I probably packed these on the sea container. Maybe some of the women at Grandview made this. Who knows? But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than all that. We continue to show love over there, church, in spite of the risks in spite of the dangers. And I don't expect anybody else to say yes to actually traveling over there. But I'm going to. I'm going to. Because the school, the well, the congregation, the soccer team, those are small ways that we demonstrate the love and the ways of Jesus. And God is using this to change things. God is using this to change the story. We have an opportunity to be part of something real and something big. Is it risky? Yes. Is it difficult? Absolutely. Is the process slow? Yes, it is. However, we're going to keep showing up. We're going to keep showing up and not just showing up to do projects, you know, to build something. That's it. Everybody says, what, what did you get done over there? What did you build? Because that's the old model of doing missions. It's not about building things. We're going over there and we're going to keep going over there because we're building relationships. And we're going over there because we're helping build relationships between ourselves and God, ourselves and those people, and those people and God and those people and one another. We're going to keep going to build these relationships and we're going to keep going and watching how God uses us and works through, through us. And so how do we show love? Is it, is it possible to show love to our enemies? Yeah, it's possible with God's help. And it probably begins, it just simply begins by praying for them. The Boko Harams, the ISIS, the people that seek to do us harm. If you're worried about that and you're concerned about that, have you prayed about that or prayed for them today or yesterday? See, that's one of the ways we begin to show love to our enemies, is we pray that God change their hearts and their heads. See, if this can happen in Nigeria, where our enemies will kill us, and we know God can work there. It'll take a while, but it's working. If we know that that can happen there, just imagine how the love demonstrated through you can change the people in your life that inconvenience you, hurt you, harm you, curse you. This is our 
calling, church. And it always will be. To be the hands and the face and the voice of Jesus. And to show love. No matter where we are and who we're dealing with. Domka Matters is just a one part of it. But it's a big part. And so again, I thank you for being part of this. And I thank you for your prayers. And I thank you that you'll continue to pray that God lead us and guide us and show us what to do and how to do it. Let's pray about that right now. Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity. Not just for me, Lord, but for many. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to radically put to test our faith in you, our trust in you. I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity, Lord, for this congregation to wrestle with what it means to proclaim the gospel for real in dangerous places. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you are producing fruit from all of our efforts. I pray that you're producing fruit and that you're making, that you're, that you're making your ways win and overcome evil. I pray, Lord God, that you help each one of us as we go into our week, as we're confronted with different challenges, as we're confronted with different people, as we are confronted with people that disagree with us, of people we don't like, people that may seek to harm us. I pray, Lord God, that you strengthen us and fortify us to represent you. Give us this strength and this hope in Jesus' name.